Hey, my name's Jeremy, and I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Shelter Cove. And I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in with us today. I firmly believe you're going to be encouraged, you're going to be inspired, but most of all, that God's going to do something through this message that's going to move you closer to Jesus. Thanks again for tuning in. Hey everybody, welcome. My name is Chad. I'm one of the pastors here at Shelter Cove. If you have your Bibles, grab them. Open up with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Uh, while you're turning to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I want to tell you about something that happened to our family back in 2019. In 2019, I was laying on the ground with my two kids, with my son and my daughter. We were playing something. I don't really remember what we were playing. Uh, my wife's over on the couch. What I do remember, I had a little protein bar. I was snacking on a protein bar. My daughter had just turned two. It was uh, like late August, early September when this happened. She comes up to me and sees me eating this protein bar and she's curious. I can tell she wants to try a, a little bite of this. So I tear off a little corner of it and I give it to her and she looks at me and goes, ooh, daddy, that's good. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty good, huh? And she starts to kind of chew it and she comes up and wants another bite and I rip off another little corner and I give it to her. Now my daughter has this habit. She will chew food and she kind of stores it into her cheek. She like straight up chipmunk will put this uh, a wad of food into her cheek and she starts doing it with this protein bar and I can see her starting to do it. She comes up and asks for a third bite and I tell her, hey sis, you gotta chew what's in your mouth. You have to chew the food that's in your mouth. And my daughter goes into full two-year-old meltdown mode. Uh, if you've ever had a two-year-old or been within about 100 yards of a two-year-old, you know the two-year-old meltdown. She starts crying hysterically. And she's doing like the wind-up cry where she's got the crying face and it's quiet, but you know that she's about to unleash all you know what. She takes in this deep breath to let out a wail. And as she takes in this deep breath, that wad of protein bar that was in her cheek, it gets lodged into her airway. Now, me and my wife didn't know that this is what happened. All we saw was her crying and getting ready to wail, and then she just kind of put her head down onto the ground. And we thought she was just being dramatic, so my wife gets off the couch and she lifts her up, and as she goes to lift her up, my daughter's little body just kind of crumples backwards. And I'll never forget what my wife said next. She scoops up our daughter and looks at her and says, oh my gosh, she's not breathing. And she hands my little daughter off to me and I, I freeze for the next second, two seconds, I'm staring at my daughter going, what, what on earth am I supposed to do? Now, by the sheer mercy and by the sheer grace of God, uh, I am what's called a bivocational pastor. That means I speak and teach here at Shelter Cove, but my full-time employment resides as a firefighter. And just the year previously, I had finished my EMT schooling. I was a nationally certified, a nationally registered EMT. And so for the first second or two, I'm staring at my daughter. I don't know what to do, and then all of a sudden, it kicks in. I tell my wife, you need to go call 911 right now. I take my daughter, I put her onto the ground, I wrap my hands around her tiny little rib cage, and I start doing compressions on her sternum. One, two, three, and on the fourth compression, it pushes this food out of her airway, and she lets loose this hysterical cry, this hysterical scream. It was music to my ears. I grab her and I flip her over and I gently start patting her on the back. I tell my wife, you can cancel the phone call. Uh, I, I tell you this story because I, I want to I correlate it to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're in a series called Grow and our topic for today is how do we mourn well? This seems like a, a, a topic that not a lot of Christians know how to do well. This may be something that you and I are ill-prepared to handle. In EMT school, they used to tell us, we hope that you never have to use CPR on someone. We hope that you never have to use the life-saving techniques that we're going to teach you. But if you do this job long enough, you're for sure going to have to use them. And I want to pass that same message on to us today. I, I hope that you never have to go through mourning. Like, I hope that you never have to suffer grief and loss I hope that you never have to experience those dark nights of the soul, but I do know if you live long enough, you're going to go through mourning. 
And so I want to just try to love you well today. I know this may not be a particularly, particularly happy or uplifting sermon. This might leave you a little bit more contemplative than normal, but I want to try to love you and serve you well and prepare our own hearts, my heart included, to be a people that know how to mourn well. Two big questions I want to try and answer. How do I mourn well as a believer? And then how do I help those who are going through mourning? I want to show you Ecclesiastes 3. We'll pray and get rolling. Here's what Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes says. Chapter 3, verse 1, he writes, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. There's a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. Verse 4, watch this. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Let me just ask the Lord to help us in the next couple of moments here. Jesus, we do pray for your help. Speak to our hearts now. Uh, For those that are in the midst of grief, God, would you comfort in ways that only you can. Uh, Jesus, make the scriptures come alive to us now. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Two big questions. How do I mourn well and how do I help those who are mourning? I want to try and tackle question number one. How do we as Christians mourn? What is the proper response? What's the proper heart stance for you and I as believers to mourn well? First bit of wisdom I want to share with you. You've got to hear this one. This might be the hardest one for some of you to hear. Number one, it is okay to mourn. It is okay to mourn. I'm not exactly sure how this kind of creeped into the Western Christian subculture, but it seems like within our churches, it seems like it's a sign of spiritual weakness to be sad or or to feel grief. I don't know where this comes from. It's kind of this unspoken expectation that if you're really mature in Christ, you're kind of bulletproof to sadness. You're kind of bulletproof to any kind of grief or mourning. And that is just simply not what's portrayed in the Bible. Men and women who are very, very devout followers of Christ, very devout followers of God, They go through seasons of deep, deep mourning. And and we saw here Solomon lay this out for us pretty clearly. He says, listen, there are are times where you're going to laugh, but you also got to understand there's times you're going to weep. There are seasons where you will dance and, and your heart will be full of gladness, but there are seasons where you are going to mourn. And you got to hear me, this is not just an isolated biblical text here. This is not just a one and done text throughout the Bible. There's all kinds of examples of mourning. Let me try to just build my case here real quickly. Uh, There's an entire book of the Bible that is dedicated to sadness, dedicated to grief, the book of Lamentations. The prophet Jeremiah has to watch as Jerusalem is literally strangled by the Babylonians. The Babylonians encircle the city of Jerusalem. They lay siege to it, cutting off all food and all water. Commerce dies, the economy dies, sickness is rampant, disease is spreading throughout the city. He watches as all of his beloved Israelite kinsmen suffer from starvation, malnutrition, and sickness. The city crumples, it disintegrates in on itself, and at its weakest moment, the Babylonians attack They murder, they slaughter anybody that puts up a fight and the rest of Jerusalem is conscripted into slavery. The Babylonians burn Jerusalem to the ground. They ransack everything that's worth value and they burn it to the ground. And Jeremiah goes through the ruins, goes through the rubble and he pens out five chapters of lament. Perhaps the strongest piece of evidence we have that that it is okay for us to lament is the very example of our Lord and Savior. Jesus himself in John 11, at the graveside of his dear friend Lazarus, weeps. I suspect that there's more at play here than just Jesus being sad about his friend's passing. Jesus knew, after all, he's going to raise him from the dead. I suspect Jesus is feeling the full gravity of, of the curse of sin. I think he sees fully how heavy the curse of sin is upon mankind. 
I, I oftentimes wonder if Jesus remembered back to what Genesis 1 and 2 was like where man and God were just in perfect harmony together. There was fellowship, there was shalom, there was peace between God and, uh, and, and man. And now Jesus sees the, the fracture of it all. He sees how sin has corrupted what was so good and right. And his response is to weep. He's heartbroken. He's devastated by it. So please hear me. It is not a sign of spiritual maturity that you never mourn. It's not a sign of spiritual health that you avoid or you steer away from mourning. The proper biblical example is that when we are faced with grief and sadness, we, we go through it. We don't avoid it. And I want you to hear from me today that it is okay. It's okay to have times and seasons where you're just sad and you go through mourning. The second piece of wisdom I want to share with you today, how do I mourn? It's okay to pray out your pain. It is okay for you to pray out your pain. Once again, I'm not sure where this came from in the Christian subculture, but it seems like we have this weird expectation that God only wants our clean, G-rated Disney movie prayers. Like if there's any kind of angst, if there's any kind of turmoil in our prayers, that God is somehow displeased with that. But that idea came nowhere from the Bible. The Bible is chock full of men coming to the feet of God and pleading with Him, just echoing these brutal, heart-wrenching prayers. I want to just show a few of them with you right now. Just a couple to show you I'm not making this up. Look at, look at what Psalm 22 says. Psalm 22, verse 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? Why are you so far from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, I find no rest. That's not all. Look at what Psalm 42 says. Psalm 42, 9, 10, and 11. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go about mourning? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Psalm 44, 19 says this, yet you have broken us in the place of jackals. You have covered us with the shadow of death. Psalm 77. Psalm 77 reads like this. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I'll show you finally here, Lamentations 3. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Verse 4 says, He's made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. 14, 13 and 14 say, He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I've become the laughing stock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He's made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. These are not just some Joe Blow people on the streets. That, that was King David. That was King Asaph, one of the greatest worship leaders in Israel's history. That's the prophet Jeremiah. And they're pleading with God, where are you? Why are you doing this to me? You, you have broken me beyond repair. I call out to you, but you ignore me. You won't even let my eyes rest at night. You won't even let me sleep. They plead and they just pray out all their angst and pain before Him. If you don't hear anything else today, hear me on this. God is big enough to hear your pain. He is big enough that you can come to Him with your sadness. 
How do we mourn? Well, you got to know it's okay to mourn. You got to know it's okay to pray out your pain. The next thing I want you to know here, the next bit of instruction I want to share with you, go to the scriptures for comfort. Go to the scriptures for comfort. The word of God is going to comfort your soul in a way my words never will be able to. No other human words will be able to. There is something divine about the scriptures. And and there's a two-pronged attack to this. There's two sides of this coin. All the verses that I just read to you from Psalms, from Lamentations, all of these verses, there's something that happens. These godly men pray out their pain, they pray out their frustration, and then they turn a corner. They turn a corner and they set their eyes and their hope back onto the Lord. I'll show you here, Lamentations 3 is probably just one of the greatest examples of it. We read this, Jeremiah says, he's made my teeth grind on gravel. He's made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is. 19 says, remember my afflictions and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall, because my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. Now watch this. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning Great, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. This is how the believer mourns differently than the unbeliever. This is how we as Christians mourn differently than the world. We will cry just like the world does. We will feel pain just like the world does. We will weep and have dark nights of the soul just like the world does. However, while the world will continue to just sit in that darkness and gloom, the believer through the scriptures is encouraged, hey, turn the corner because at the end of the dark hallway, there's light. There's a faint little glimmer of light. And I love the example here Jeremiah sets in the midst of his weeping, in the midst of just praying out, you have, you've stolen happiness from me. I, I can't even feel happiness. You have robbed my soul of peace. I don't even know what it feels like anymore. But I, I remember. I remember that you're faithful. I remember that your mercies never come to an end. And so the gravity of this loss is heavy. But this I recall to mind, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's different than the way the world mourns. We turn the corner and and we see the faint glimmer of hope off in the distance. So this is the the first way you can look to the Scriptures for comfort. But but then there's just another real simple way to find comfort in the Scriptures. I I don't know another way to say it other than there's some verses that will just become like warm, like a warm blanket to your soul. There's certain verses that just kind of wrap you up and they just just seem to comfort in in ways that few other verses can. Uh, For me, one of those verses is right out of the Psalms. The Psalms are such a great book when you're in a season of mourning. Psalm 34, 18, for me, has just become one of these verses that that comforts and nurtures the soul. Check this out. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Uh, I don't know what that verse will be for you. I, I encourage you to check out the Psalms, man. Find one of these verses that will just nurture and comfort your soul. How do we mourn well? We've got to, first of all, see it's okay to mourn. It's okay to pray out your pain. Lean upon the scriptures. Lean upon the word of God to find comfort for your soul. Fourth and finally here, don't go through mourning alone. Do not go through mourning alone. I was talking with a man, one of the most godly men I know in my life. He was relaying the experience to me of watching his wife die from cancer. She had cancer. Uh, They thought that she was beating it, uh, was healthy for some time, and then the cancer came back with a vengeance uh, and and took her very quickly. 
And he was saying to me that, that one of the most powerful experiences he had was seeing how the body of Christ rallied around him. I don't know what kind of mourning you're going through, and, and I understand that there will be times where you just need to be alone. But my challenge to you and my encouragement to you would be don't, don't keep people at arm's length for too long. You're going to need help. Allow people to come in and help. Allow people to sit with you and cry with you. Allow people to bring you food. Allow people to walk through grief with you. Because here's the thing about grief. Here's the thing about mourning. It takes time to process. It takes time to work through. You're going to need people for you to share your grief with. Not just once, not just twice. Over and over and over again. There's a great proverb that says there's a, a friend who sticks closer than a brother. When you're going through seasons of mourning, don't isolate. Don't hide. Let people help you. Now, that's a, a really hard question. How do I mourn well as a believer? I want to try to tackle now a second question that is equally just as challenging how do I, as a believer, help those who are going through sadness? How do I help someone who's going through mourning? And the first bit of wisdom I want to share with you, practice the gift of presence. Just be present. Just be present. I think so oftentimes we avoid people who are in seasons of mourning and avoid seasons of grief because we, we know very well that our words are going to fall short. We know very well that we don't have the right words to say and we feel intimidated by it. And we don't know, man, I want to say something silly. I don't want to go there and say something foolish. I just wish I had something that would be able to fix it all. And the truth of the matter is we don't. The truth of the matter is our words will come up very short. But there's something powerful about our presence. There's something powerful about us just showing up and being silent. I know as a pastor, I've had to sit in a lot of hospital rooms. I've had to be around a lot of people who are going through loss. I've had to do a lot of funerals. And there's something that I say over and over and over again to families. Hey, I wish I had something I could say that would make this go away. But I don't. But I want you to know I'll be here. I want you to know that you're not alone. And then sometimes it's just taking 30, 40 minutes to sit with them. And there's long pauses of silence. And it can feel a little bit weird. And it can feel a little bit awkward. But the gift of your presence speaks louder than any words ever would. There's a, a famous author who wrote this book called Lament for a Son. He had to go through the loss of his son. He said, death is awful. It's demonic. If you think your task as a comforter is to tell me that really, all things considered, it's not so bad, you do not sit with me in my grief, but place yourself off in the distance away from me. Over there, you're of no help. What I need to hear from you is that you recognize how painful it is. I need to hear from you that you are with me in my desperation. To comfort me, you have to come close. Come sit beside me on my morning bench. The proper response is not some clever phrase or some clever words or some clever verse. It's just presence. Second of all, practice. Practice prayer. That same man I was speaking about earlier who lost his wife to cancer, he said one of the greatest gifts people offered to him was simply praying for him. He was sharing with me there, there were seasons where the only prayer he could muster up was, Lord, you know I love you. And that was it. He had literally no strength, no other words to offer in that grief. And he said to me specifically, knowing that I had people in my life that were praying for me, that were going to the Lord on my behalf, was so encouraging to my heart because I was so weak and hurt in that season that I just couldn't. I didn't have it in me. So when someone you know is going through seasons of great loss and mourning, one of the greatest gifts you can give to them is prayer. It tends to be something that we look past because we want to be more active. We want to feel like we've got more hands on this. 
but going before God Almighty and praying for them. Powerful way to love those that are in mourning. And finally here, point them to Jesus. Here's what I don't mean by that. What I don't mean is, hey, uh, give them some Christian cliches that aren't found in the Bible. Like, hey, God will never give you something that you can't handle. Uh, That's found nowhere in the scriptures. And if you follow Jesus long enough, you'll find that that's not true. He gives us stuff all the time that we can't handle. Hey, bro, footsteps in the sand, man. Jesus is carrying you. Like that may be well-intentioned, that may have a good motive behind it, but it oftentimes does little to comfort the soul. In fact, sometimes it can make them even more resentful of your efforts because it did nothing to help. Rather, here's what I mean, point them to the fact that Jesus is a man who is well acquainted with sorrow. That's right out of Isaiah 53. Point them to the fact that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Remind them that Jesus has felt sorrow just like they have. And that he won't abandon them. Remind them that his grace will be sufficient for them today. Remind them that, hey, This may be painful. This may be one of the most brutal things your heart ever has to suffer. But Jesus isn't going anywhere. As I said earlier, I I pray that you never have to use what we've talked about today. But I also know that if the Bible's true and if life experience tells us anything, you live long enough, you're going to hurt. So how do we respond to this? I think there's one of three responses for us. Number one, if things are good for you, if you're in a season of joy, then rejoice in that. Be thankful for that. And just pray that the Lord would get your heart ready for the seasons of difficulty to come. You don't need to feel bad that things are good. You don't need to feel guilty that things are good. Rejoice and enjoy it and ask that the Lord would prep your heart. And second of all, For those of you that are in seasons of mourning, ask that the Lord would comfort your heart and give you strength. And for those of you, thirdly, now that know those who are going through seasons of mourning and loss, ask the Lord, how can I love these people well? How can I help them and be a source of godly encouragement? I pray that this sermon finds you doing well. And what I want to do now is just close our time with a quick word of prayer. Jesus, thank you so much that you are a man who suffered himself and knows firsthand what it's like to go through what we go through. I pray, Lord, that you would meet those who are broken now. God, be near to those who are crushed in spirit and save them. And God, I pray that you would teach us as the church, as the body of Christ, how can we love those well who are in seasons of mourning? Show us what to do, God. Make it clear what you want us to do and give us the courage, give us the fortitude to act upon it. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Hey, God bless. We love you guys. Have a great rest of your week. We'll see you later.